Uh, Aaron Edwards with the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair uh, and members. Uh, your staff asked me to come here today to speak about our recently released report on implement implementation of Proposition 47 and how that impacts state corrections. So uh, we recently released, uh, as I mentioned, a report on that subject. It should be in front of you now. It looks like this. Uh, and then in addition, you should also have a handout in front of you, which I'll be speaking from today, that looks like this. And it is a summary of the components of our report that relate specifically to uh, state corrections that, it, that is germane to our conversation here today. Uh, so in this handout, what we do is we provide a, a quick overview of how Prop 47 uh, affects the uh, state corrections. Uh, we also summarize some of the governor's proposals in this area. And then we provide some concerns. Uh, we raise some concerns with some of those proposals and then provide some recommendations for your consideration. So if you'll turn to the first page of the handout, I'll start with a brief summary of Prop 47 and how it affects state corrections. So the measure, the main thrust of the measure is a reduction in penalties for certain nonviolent and non-serious crimes, uh, primarily property and drug crimes. And in fact, about 85% of the impacted crimes we estimate will be uh, drug possession crimes. The measure also allows offenders who are currently sentenced for those crimes to appeal to a court to be resentenced uh, under the measure for, uh, to a lesser term. And so those changes will reduce the prison population both by prospectively changing the number of people that will be coming to prison in the future, but also by allowing some inmates who are currently in the prison system to be released early. Uh, the, and then finally, the measure would also result in a slight increase in the parole population because under the measure, individuals who are resentenced would be required to serve one year on state parole unless a judge waives that requirement. So if you'll turn to the second page of the handout, I will talk about the impact on meeting the state, uh, meeting the federal court ordered uh, population cap. So uh, as you probably know, in recent years, the state has been under a federal court order to reduce the prison population uh, to the levels which are detailed in the figure you'll see at the top of this page. The department has been maintaining uh, a buffer, as we call it, to make sure that if the population in the prisons fluctuates unexpectedly at any point in time, the state won't exceed the population cap and be forced to release inmates. Uh, in the first few months of 2014, the 2014-15 budget year, that buffer was about 2,500 beds or so. And uh, at no point has the state come within 1,000 beds of exceeding the cap. Uh, currently, the buffer is actually growing bigger, as the Secretary mentioned. This is primarily, we think, because of Prop 47. So, um, as the Secretary mentioned, we're actually, we've already met and exceeded the final deadline uh, that we have to meet by February 2016. So, in other words, uh, we uh, are below that cap by about 1,300 inmates, even though we haven't activated the new infill facilities that are supposed to be activated in February 2016. Uh, so if you'll turn to the next page of the handout, we'll talk uh, briefly about the governor's proposals in, in this area. Uh, so the governor is proposing a reduction of $12.7 million to CDCR's budget um, due to Proposition 47. Um, this is because the budget is assuming a reduction of 1,900 inmates uh, in the state's prisons. And uh, it's important to note here that the Governor's budget is assuming that as this inmate population declines, there will be fewer inmates housed in the 34 state prisons, as opposed to fewer inmates housed in contract beds. Um, this will have some important fiscal implications, as we'll talk a little bit about more later. Um, the reason is that when you reduce the prison population, uh, as the Secretary noted, you don't get the full average cost because those marginal changes don't typically re result in major changes to staffing levels. And so when we reduce one inmate in the prison system, we save about $9,500 annually, versus if we were to reduce a contract bed, we would save about $28,000 annually. So the 
in, in if you account for the increase in the parole population, uh, the total change, as I said, is about $12.7 million in CDCR's budget. Um, so that brings me to the governor's uh, proposals for complying with the three-judge panel uh, population cap. Uh, so uh, the governor's budget is assuming that we will remain in compliance throughout the budget year with the population cap, um, primarily because of a declining uh, prison population. Uh, however, the state's ability to comply with the cap does depend on a couple of other factors. So one is the number of contract beds that the state is maintaining, uh, and the second is the design capacity of the state's 34 prisons. And so the governor's budget has a couple of proposals that will affect these two variables, which I'll describe briefly here. Uh, the first is the governor's budget is assuming a slight increase in the level of contract bed funding. Uh, specifically, the budget proposes uh, $495 million to maintain a, a just under 16,000 beds in the budget year. That's a slight increase, about 4% over the revised current year level of funding. In addition, the governor's budget includes $36 million to activate three currently uh, uh, three facilities that would add a capacity to the state's 34 prisons. So these are new infill facilities on the grounds of existing prisons. They would add, it would be about 2,400 beds, and at an overcrowding rate of 137.5%, uh, that would allow the state to add about 3,300 additional inmates into the 34 prisons when those facilities become activated. Uh, so if you'll turn to uh, the fourth page of the handout, uh, I'll just very briefly cover here, because I, I think the Secretary already uh, did a, a good job of speaking to how they developed the plan and, um, and the fact that it does it was developed with some uncertainties in mind. And so uh, I won't go into great detail here. I um, do just want to note one thing, which is um, the, uh, the administration has determined because of this uncertainty around the, what the population will be and the difficulty in projecting the population, because of Prop 47 and some other court order changes, they, they have declined to publish their long-term population projections that they would typically uh, provide to the legislature and to the public um, and have in past years provided. Um, so uh, if you'll turn to the fifth page of your handout, um, the next few pages are a summary of uh, some of the concerns that we have with the governor's proposals. Um, so our primary concern is uh, we think that the budget provides uh, about at least $20 million more than is necessary for uh, contract beds in the budget year. Uh, in fact, this amount we think could be even greater uh, depending on whether the new infill facilities are activated on time and how that court counts that uh, new capacity. Uh, so there are a few different issues going on here. And, and the first one is that um, the department is planning to maintain uh, what we think is an uh, excessive buffer. Um, and in, throughout the 15-16 budget year, um, the governor's budget would re result in an average buffer of about uh, 4,300 inmates or so. Um, and that buffer would shrink somewhat depending on how the court counts the, the new capacity from those new facilities. Um, however, uh, under any scenario, we think that the buffer would be uh, close to 4,000. And uh, Again, get, because the contract beds are typically more expensive than already constructed prison beds, um, we think the state could achieve significant savings by maintaining a smaller buffer and without really meaningfully increasing the risk of um, falling out of compliance with the court order. So, for example, if the department maintained a buffer of about 2,500 beds, which is similar to what we've been maintaining over the first few months of the current year, uh, we estimate that would save uh, potentially tens of millions of dollars uh, in the budget year. Um, if the uh, activation of the infills is delayed, and again, as the Secretary noted earlier, there is some uncertainty as to whether these facilities will be activated on time in February. Um, but 
if those facilities are delayed, we find that there would be some operational savings. Uh, to the extent there are no inmates in those facilities, um, there would not be uh, cost for guarding those inmates. There wouldn't be cost for feeding and clothing those inmates. And so you would have significant operational savings that uh, could be redirected to cover the cost of a, a higher level of contract bed funding that would be needed. And then finally, if you'll turn to the next page of your handout, um, what I've just described to you and the level of savings I've just characterized uh, is based on the governor's uh, or the, the administration's population projections. Um, however, uh, in our view, we think the administration may be underestimating the population impacts of Proposition 47. Uh, and so if the impacts of Prop 47 actually are greater than they're projecting, which we think is likely, and the inmate population then is lower than what the administration is assuming, there could actually be even greater savings than what we've described, uh, perhaps by uh, tens of millions of dollars more um, than what we just described. Uh, so if you'll turn to uh, page 7, uh, our uh, final concern here is that the lack of those long-term population projections uh, that I spoke about earlier uh, we think makes it very difficult for the legislature to plan for the future. Uh, and in the long term, we think that the legislature may have some options available. If the population continues to decline significantly, uh, it may be possible to uh, permanently reduce our use of contract beds or even consider uh, the closure of a state prison. Uh, and so the the appropriate course of action and the most fiscally prudent course of action is really going to depend in large measure on what the long-term population trends look like. And so without the population projections, it's really impossible for the legislature to make a, a well-informed decision about how to plan for those future adjustments to funding and capacity for the Department of Corrections. And so that brings us to our recommendations on the final page of the handout. Uh, our first recommendation is that um, we think the legislature could reduce the governor's proposed contract bed funding level by at least uh, $20 million by directing CDCR to move inmates from contract beds into state prisons. Um, how, however, the amount of the savings could actually be greater uh, depending on the timing of the activation of the infill, uh, how the court counts the infill capacity, uh, and then how the actual inmate population levels compare to what the administration's budget assumes. Uh, so with that in mind, we are recommending that the legislature not approve the proposed contract bed funding uh, until the department can provide information on how the population projections are comparing uh, to the actual population. Um, whether the infill facilities are on track to be activated on schedule and the status of its negotiations with plaintiffs o over how the court will count the new capacity uh, that's added by those infill facilities. And then finally, we are recommending that the legislature direct uh, CDCR to resume its historical practice of providing the long-term population projections biannually. Um, this information would allow the legislature to better assess uh, and plan for the long-term implications of Prop 47 uh, and other uh, uh, court-ordered population reduction measures and adjust the prison capacity accordingly. Uh, and we do certainly recognize that there, there are um, difficulties projecting what the population will be in the future. Um, that's always the case, and I think it's even more so now given these different policy changes. Um, however, I think from our viewpoint, having data uh, with some caveats attached and understanding what the limitations of it are is better than having no data at all for your planning purposes. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Uh, happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, it's a lot of information. In fact, um, um, it's, a, it's a different place than we were a year ago. I mean, a year ago... If you had said we'd be talking about having buffers because we've met the three-court judge, um, that we would meet the three-court judge uh, numbers, uh, I, I think people would have probably said you were crazy, the fact that we're there. Um, it's just a different, I mean, it was, in a lot of ways it's taken us by shock. And so 
um, I'm inclined to um, um, to agree that we need to probably come together and try to think of some ways that we can gauge this because this is, and I think even Secretary Beard will will admit we had there's no way we could have planned this and probably in our wildest dreams we didn't think we would get to this level. Um, but I have a couple of questions. I think some of the members of the committee may have some. Um, the court ordered um, population reduction, and um, have you thought about any long-term plan for um, how we're going to maintain compliance with the with the court order, um, or how we could make it go away? I mean, I know it's difficult being under a court order, and obviously I'm not a lawyer, but is there a way we can we can get our way out of this so that we're not constantly on this? What are some things we need to do, steps that we can get to while we have this advantage right now. Right. Um, well, you know, I think, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the biggest thing we have to do is to show the courts that we have a sustainable process to continue to bring down the population in the prison system, at least for the foreseeable future. And like 10 years? I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to project out that far because, as I said, we don't have the trend date. It's hard to go out much more in a couple of years. but. You know, I think we have to show that we're doing things that are going to continue to bring it down and that at least for, for the, as far as we can see, the population is going to be coming down. And what that's going to mean is, is something has to be legislatively done. I mean, you have to, you have to pass something uh, that's going to impact on the population, whether you do things that the courts have ordered and, and some of those things that, that are, are, the, are the biggest impact, the second striker stuff, okay. uh, that would require uh, at least a two-thirds vote of the legislature. So some of those things are going to be very, very difficult to do. Uh, I think we're all going to have to work together and talk together and come up with a, a plan on, on how we can do this. Uh, because if you don't do it if we don't do it if we don't come up with a plan the court i think will become more and more intrusive and more directing on us uh, because i think they really want to go away at the end of the day too and we have to realize that that three judge panel sits over top of the plot on coleman cases yeah. and so it's probably very unlikely that we can work on getting rid of those two cases if we don't get rid of the three judge panel case and so um We've got to look at everything and come up with a plan uh, that will get us to where the, the, the judges feel comfortable that we have a sustainable solution. Uh, the population's going down. The inmates are coming back from out of state. And I think once that occurs, I don't think it will be instantaneous, but once that occurs and they, they feel comfortable we're doing that, then I think the three-judge panel goes away. Now, I sit on the Public Safety Committee. Is that something that um, you could work with, with my office to determine what kind of um, legislation, that's what it sounds like, mm -hmm. that we could possibly show to our colleagues in, in the assembly first um, to get us there. And maybe, you know, one to sure. ten or a comprehensive package that we probably can't legislate this year, but maybe we can introduce next year. But we can at least begin that conversation and drill down to exactly what you're talking about mm -hmm. and, and start um, shopping it around and see if it's something um, that we can obviously legislate. But most important, like you said, we begin to show that it sounds like you want us to self-regulate ourselves and show the three-court judge that we're serious about reducing the number. And not only are we serious, we're going to show you in our legislation or in our budget. Is that right, And I think that's, that's very important because I think in the past, uh, the courts don't feel the state has done anything unless they've ordered it. And so part of getting them to feel comfortable is to show that the state is going to go out and do something without the court always ordering it. I think that's part of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rodriguez? I'm fine. Okay. And I think I've lost the rest of my, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of my committee. Um, that... Uh, one of the things that I, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and ask members that we withhold action pending some additional information, and, and I don't want to use the word justification. I want to use it. I want to get some more information. I, this whole thing about 
trying to provide long-term population um, projections or trends. Um, I would like to have something in place um, when we meet again to talk about this, when we reschedule this, mm -hmm. that um, we can all agree on as it's not perfect because of obviously certain limitations, but at least begin the components of what we need in the long-term projections so that long after we can start watching the trends, but at least we know what those elements are uh, and, and working with your, your office and staff to, to get there. So I would like to hold it um, in this committee until then, and then we'll, we'll bring it back. Okay, I think that's fine, and, and I do have people that can talk uh, more specifically about okay. that uh, and, and the plans that we have to try to get back there. Uh, it's just not going to be something that's overnight. It's not going to be tomorrow. Correct, correct. And, that's and, and so, but we are working on that. We have a number of things, working on new modeling uh, uh, techniques to, to get a, a better sense of where we're going, try to get some better trend data. You know, the more months mm -hmm. that we have, the further we go along, the more data we have. And, and so I think we're working on all of that, and, and we do have a plan in place. And I mean, if you have another hearing, and, you know, unless you want somebody to come up and talk, in greater detail now, which I can do. Uh, uh, let's let's hold it for now, and then we can our office can talk, and then we can bring back to the committee members something a little more comprehensive. Okay, that's fine. And uh, it, yes, we it may not take a long time, but we 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 can't go past May revise. So no, I understand. <laughs> right, I understand. We will have something right. uh, by then. So okay, okay. with that. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, issue number two, budgetary changes after enactment of the 2014 Budget Act. The issue before the subcommittee, it budgetary changes after enactment of the 2014 Budget Act. Um, CDCR will begin. Good afternoon, uh, Jason Lopez, Deputy Director of Fiscal Services for the Department. Um, okay, so um, in my language, I see this as us wanting to discuss uh, our Section 26 adjustment that, um, as the agenda points out, arrived uh, around August of last year uh, for the fiscal year that had ended uh, June 30th uh, in 2014. Um, we have had an opportunity to work with uh, your staff and the LAO on uh, how to address this going forward. We acknowledge that um, the timing of the request was uh, not in line with what any of us would like to see. So uh, the conversations that we've had with uh, those individuals uh, have led us to all agree that the department will have uh, this year's Section 26 adjustment uh, before you all uh, in a time that allows you all to look at it as part of the May revise. Um, would you like me to get into the details of the 26, just, or do you want to? Just a little bit. I mean, if I were to provide background, okay. um, um, we didn't receive notification of, of this adjustment until after basically we were gone. And, and, and I think from a legislative standpoint, um, we were concerned because we had made decisions, voted on it, governor signs off, and and then we get this note that says uh, we, we need to shift money a certain way because we can't pay our bills. And uh, I guess what was disturbing was the letter that came back from the Senate budget side, um, State Senator Leno, uh, that this is done all the time. It's like a, an annual thing um, from a new person, new member, it's almost like switching bait, and it's almost like you're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. I'm just. I assure you that was not our intent, be, but I get it. I'm just giving you the appearance. Yes. That it had for us, um, and 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 it, it. There were several members that were very very upset, especially for us that had experienced it for the first time, and you can imagine individuals who had been part of budget to have this happen year after year after year. And then we got recommendations um, from LAO and the Department of Finance, and we all kind of came together and said, we need, to, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen ever again. Um, and so um, uh, I think 
where you're moving forward. The reason it's on the agenda, so we can talk about it openly, so that we can, so everybody can understand why it's there, and so the members, so that um, if that letter comes out again, then Mr. Bigelow is going to put his hat on, and they're going to be hell to pay. Understood. So, okay. Second discussion. <laughs> The second issue that um, Mr. Leno's memo mentioned that I think is noteworthy for the committee is uh, there was some talk about the magnitude of the request. So the request involved shifting about $260 million. Uh, a large portion of that was tied to a bit of a disconnect that existed between uh, our salaries and wages and our overtime on uh, for our custody staff specifically. Um, as you know from listening to our, our conversations about the Academy over the last year or so, uh, we've been wrestling with a, a pretty significant vacancy rate um, for CEOs specifically. And uh, that vacancy rate was driving the need to shift money from overtime, uh, sorry, the other way around, from salaries and wages over to cover overtime uh, for these posted positions that were going to run whether we had a, a body assigned to them or not. So. What you all have agreed to do in current year is you've, you've uh, consolidated those two programs. So that in itself is going to reduce the magnitude of the proposal you're going to see this year, the Section 26 shift, uh, by 80%. It's, it's most of the proposal that we've seen for the last couple of years. So, with that said, and trying to be of the good nature that moi is at times, <laughs> what if? What if it doesn't work out that way? Because I've always learned, like, if, if you're exceeding year after year the cost in overtime for staffing, fill the position and reduce the cost. It seems like there's a pattern here. So my concern is, have you really vetted this? And, and are you certain this is going to happen? Because I, I, I am going to be, you know, being a new guy on the committee, um, a little sticklish about this. I mean... That's the way I operate in my life. And, and I think that the chair recognizes we all kind of felt a little, wait a minute, what's going on here? So maybe you can answer that. What if that 80% saving doesn't occur? What are you going to do then? Come with hat in hand? Uh, absolutely. No pun but intended for it, me it that wears a hat. Uh, it's not going to happen. The, the, the magnitude of the request will be reduced significantly. <laughs> I hate when it's I'd say with great gonna... certainty. <laughs> okay. Uh, in, um, you alluded to the, the vacancy rate and it driving the overtime. I don't know if that issue is something you'd like me to expand a little bit on as far as the, the department's efforts to address that. But I, I don't think you need to. I understand okay. that pretty thoroughly coming from a local government background where vacancy rates occur, mostly in the safety side because of people, one, other, one reason after another, sickness, uh, they're out on whatever. Right. Um, of course, the biggest issue I've got is the retirement program. I'm carrying as many people on retirement full-time pay as I am full-time paid working. So it's, Yes, sir. I can relate. It's a real big issue. Thanks, okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bigelow. Uh, Department of Finance, do you have any? So, Jock, our Department of Finance. So just to speak to the overtime issue a little bit, to, to be clear, the department is still running overtime behind vacant positions and doing everything they can to fill those vacant positions. However, the Section 26 um, that you would see in the future would no longer request to transfer funds for that from one program to another. But the department is doing everything they can to fill vacancies, running academies, and um, the number of cadets that come out of the academy does not exceed the number of retirements by enough to eliminate vacancies uh, quickly. So there will be overtime behind vacant positions, but uh, the department continues to make every effort to uh, eliminate that as much as possible through running academies. Okay. LAO. I think we've made our thoughts on this matter pretty well known over the years repeatedly, particularly on the issue of the, the timing of these notifications, so I don't think we have anything to add at this point. Okay, okay. And, and just so, I, actually I do have to go, so you're filling, have you filled all your vacancies? 
No. In, in the CO classification, uh, because of the number of people who are going out the door while we're producing as many cadets as we possibly can, the net progress we're making is not what we would all like to see. So we're, we're producing as many cadets as our academy in Galt will support, uh, but still just inching away at the 2,000 plus vacancies that we're facing in that classification. Okay, so you, you have like a vacancy buffer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Thank you. But ultimately you can reasonably forecast today based on what your projections of cadet growth is and what your uh, losses are going to be through attrition or whatever, you know what that defined number is. You should be able yes. to tell us already yes. what that number is with, with some level of certainty. Maybe we, not full accuracy, but some level of certainty. We experience an attrition rate of about 160 a month. Because all you're doing when you're doing the masking, which is what you're doing between two programs, you're going to be masking what's really occurring. I Everyone is in favor of having this all aligned and having our vacancies filled, and we're doing everything we can to fill those positions. They're still going to be, you're still going to be in the same place at the end of the day with, with, with overtime. I, I would just be one like the chairman. Let's get this down to some certainty in advance, and I think you can project that reasonably. I'm sorry, I'm just venting. 